certainly in comp, comp 1917, there's, um, as you know, no new syntax to be brought in. Really no new ideas. We're going to explore the idea of trees a little bit. We're now in consolidation mode and revision mode and application mode. And this week we're looking at a couple of interesting things that have um, nothing really to do with the project. So we sort of deferred them till after the project. We're going to look at ethics and professionalism and what it means to be a computer scientist and what work's going to be like once you're working. Shh, 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 shh. And we're also going to talk about a couple of neat ideas in, computer, in computing, in computer science. Some ideas like um, how to use codes, how to transmit data. We're going to revisit our microprocessor and we're going to look at how it's looking and maybe in, it, we've got time for one last change. How could we improve it? Because it's, it's not looking good at the moment, I think you'd agree. And, uh, and then we're sort of wrapping everything up. Next week's lectures will be, um, we'll do some new stuff on Monday and then on the Wednesday lecture we'll go over the exam We'll talk about what's going to be in the exam and how you need to study for the exam. We'll talk about all that sort of stuff. And we'll also do the feedback on the course, which is your chance to tell us how we should do things differently next time and make suggestions. Uh, and we'll also have a prize ceremony where we hand out prizes and awards to everyone who's done neat stuff along the way. So I do hope you don't miss the last uh, lecture. If you're going to miss one, miss uh, today's lecture. <laughs> uh, okay. Have you said, yeah, I'm out of here. Has it, have I already said this? I saw the, like, the ad for Shrek 3 or something and it said, if you only see um, one film this year, see, see Shrek 3 or something like that. And then the other voice said, well, hang on, they're already watching a film if they're watching this promo. He goes, oh yeah. Okay, if you only see two films this year. And so yeah, okay, it's a bit like that. Uh, all right. First of all, our random number generator from last week. I'd like to finish that off. Do you remember we came up with a very simple one? Well, it was von Neumann's one. We didn't come up with it, which is to take a 10-digit number and square it. Our first 10-digit number is called our seed of our sequence. We square it and strip off the five leading and terminating numbers to give us another 10-digit number, which is the next number in our random sequence, and we iterate this process over and over again. Applying a function to itself over and over like that is actually a common thing to do in maths, and it's quite cute. And if you end up with an input that produces the same output, does anyone know what that's called? Periodic. If you cycle through a series of numbers, that's called, a cycle is periodic, and a cycle of length one has a special name? Um, no, 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 uh, Rhymes with mix point. <laughs> it's a fixed point. <laughs> okay, so can anyone think, is, can you think of a fixed point for the squaring um, random number generator? Zero. You stick zero in, you square it, you strip numbers off, zero goes to zero. Can you think of another one? One. one. No. What's going to happen if you get one and square it, what do you get? One. one. And then you strip that out, that goes to zero. So that's one step away from a fixed point, then it, there's a fixed point at zero. I found another fixed point just by fooling around, like a thousand or something like that, or, or ten thousand or something. It was some number that when you squared it and stripped the numbers off, you got the same number. I think it was ten thousand or it might have been a hundred thousand or something like that. You'll find that fairly small numbers, when you square them, won't get big enough to produce the next number that's bigger than zero. Because remember, we stripped the last five digits off, so it's got to be quite big to get anything into the next couple of digits. So once you get it to any small number in your sequence, it straight away degenerates to zero. So we were a bit concerned that it had these aspects of bad behavior, that the sequence could go along for a while and suddenly just terminate and just go one, 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 oh, sorry, zero, 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 or a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, or whatever it is. So we were a bit itchy about that and we started to think what would make this a good random number generator and we decided good means it has a fairly long period. So it's ultimately going to have to cycle no matter what number it's on because there aren't an infinite number of numbers. Yeah, there aren't an infinite number of values it can have. It can only ever produce a 10 digit number. So there's only however many of them there are, 10 billion of those. So after it's produced all 10 billion possible numbers it's going to have to cycle somehow. So it can't have a period longer than 10 billion and it's probably going to have a shorter period, yes? Oh yeah, look, that's another way of getting random numbers. You're suggesting another way. I was just interested in this particular von Neumann way. But your way is quite a cute way. Um, if you look at the digits of pi, uh, often we generate random numbers by just stripping uh, digits out of pi because pi is supposed to behave in a fairly chaotic way. But there was some research done quite recently, I think last year I saw about looking at digits of pi 
for randomness, and there was a slight problem. I can't remember what it was. Are you putting up your hand because you know what it was? Uh, I think I can guess pretty much. What was that? Everyone knows what pi is, so if you can work out what the periodicity of, is it, of what numbers you're taking out of it, you can pretty much predict what the next one's going to be. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. No, what, Jacob, what Jacob said, shh, shh, yeah. Yeah, you could use that as a seed, yeah. What Jacob said was uh, taking numbers straight from pi is, is no good because we know the next number. So although it appears to be random, it also has this property, although it looks random, we actually know what's going to happen next. So now we come back to the question that we asked in the extension lecture, which is how do we know, what, what do we mean by random numbers? Uh, if we're not talking about cryptography, random numbers are normally just ones that are statistically indistinguishable from random numbers. We're happy with that. So you can't predict. Knowing the past numbers doesn't help you know what the next number is sort of thing. A cryptographic one is one where you cannot work out what's going to happen next. So pi would be a terrible cryptographic random number generator. But it's often used, I mean, it can be used as a normal random number generator. Um, but I did read recently, I can't remember the research. I'll look it up and tell you next lecture. There was a problem. Yeah? Also, you said that you've only got, what, 10 billion possible configurations for your one million random number generator. Yes. Is it possible that you could have, you could hit the same number twice from different <coughs> orientations? Yes. Like two ways interfering with each other? Yes. And move off in different directions? No. Yeah, no, let me explain that. The question was, is it possible your sequence is toddling along like this? You produce, I'm only going to produce small numbers. Imagine these are 10 digit numbers. You produce 37, then you produce 92, then you produce 56, and then you produce 72, uh, 27, and then you produce 92, and then you produce 56, and then you produce uh, 83. Can you, could you do some sort of loop like that? And can everyone see the answer is no with the method we've got? It's certainly possible that more than one value could feed into 92. That's quite possible. But it's not possible that 56 could lead to two different outputs because it's completely deterministic. Square it and strip it, it'll go to just one thing. So once we hit a loop, we're trapped in the loop forever. So um, the sort of the point where we left when we were looking at the random number generator last week was we were wondering, gee, how long does this thing go before it hits a loop? Let's give it a starting value and it'd be interesting to know how long it goes before it hits a loop. Uh, and then we had to stop the lecture. But now I want to sort of finish that thought off. How could we find, as computer programmers, how could we find how long it went before we hit a, hit a loop? What could we do? We could somehow count it. We could get the computer to monitor it. Yeah, computers are good at monitoring boring things. So rather than it, us generating all the output and us staring at it, trying to see when a loop happens, and remember all the numbers we've seen up until now, and I don't know how many 10-digit numbers you can remember, but I hope it's not many. Um, instead of us wasting our eyes doing it, why don't we set the computer up to watch it and itself monitor and look for a loop? So how would we get the computer to look for a loop? Think yourself. Don't call it out. Think yourself. I want to write a program that gets given a sequence of numbers, and it has to remember if any number it gets is one it's already seen. How could you do that? Now, I hope, don't tell me, don't tell me. I hope you're thinking, the first question is, what data structure should I use? I'm hoping that's what you're thinking. And you're thinking, how will I store it? Somehow I've got to store the ones I've already seen. How will I store them? There's lots of ways of storing them. But given that there's potentially 10 billion of them, or even more, maybe, if, if we went to bigger numbers. Uh, it's got more, doesn't it? Uh, an, an array that's 10 billion long is, is, uh, is no good. An array, you, you might think, oh, I could have 10 billion bits. And each bit could recall whether I'd seen that number before. And 10 billion bits, you can almost squeeze into memory, can't you? Because 10 billion bits is how many billion bytes? One, one and a bit billion bytes, you know, eight bits to a byte. So if you had a, a one point something gig machine, that memory free for you to just have one single array, I guess you could. But that's an, you see, that doesn't scale very much. We're on the edge of that happening. So suppose we can't do it that way. Suppose we can't just literally store a tick every time we see a number in a particular spot, because there aren't enough spots. Yeah, it would take too much memory to have a different spot for every number. So we have to have some sort of structure where we just keep track of what we've seen so far. How could you keep track of what we've seen so far? Yes? A binary tree. A binary tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we build up to that? Like, could you give me the, the, the wrong answer first? How, ca how could we, because that's, that's the right answer. Can anyone think how, what's that? A list. a list. Yes, thank you very much. That's a good idea. I can see why you suggested that. A list of some sort. And we just add each new number we see to the list. Now, we could store the list in an array. 
um, but we have problems in C about needing to know how big an array is in advance. But one way is we could store the list in an array. Another way is we could just have a linked list. And every time we get a new number, just append a new dude on. Now, oh, actually, the pain with linked lists, I should say, is that because each li link has to store the number and a pointer to the next one, and the number's going to be a 32-bit thing, and the pointer to the next one, on my machine at least, is a 32-bit thing, 64 bits to store every number. So it actually consumes memory quite quickly, twice as quickly as if we just stored them in an array. But, but an array or a linked list are both a list. It's something linear about them. So yeah, we could keep a linear track of the things we've seen. And it would be easy, every time you see a new one, you just add it on to, well, with a linked list, where would you add it? Beginning or end. But if you're adding it to the end, you certainly wouldn't want to troll along the whole list to find it. You'd maybe keep a second pointer to the last one each time so you can jump straight to the end. Or you'd insert it in the beginning. So somehow, or in an array, you'd stick it in the next spot. So that seems easy. But once you've put it in, what's the question you have to ask? I mean, before you put it in, what's the question you have to answer? Do I have space written? Now, suppose we've got space, but I've just, you've just generated a number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What do I have to, what's the question I want to know? Have I already seen one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? So I look at my list, which is very long, and I think, now is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine already in that list or not? Now remember, we talked a bit about this in a previous lecture. What are my options? If it's an unsorted list, what can I do? Traverse the whole list, toddle along the list looking for it. That will take a long time as the list gets bigger and bigger. Remember, potentially it can have billions of things in it. So I don't really want to search through the whole list. Then we thought of a way of making it faster. How can I do that? I could have a sorted list and I could sort of um, jump to the right spot. I mean, I'd know when it was, if it wasn't in there, I could give up halfway through. That was an advantage. Or if I wanted to be able to jump to the right spot, I could have it in an array. And I'd be able to find out straight away, using binary search, I could quickly ripple through the array and find out if it was in there or not. But the problem is, if it isn't in there, what do I then have to do? Stick it in. And what's the problem with sticking something in the middle of an array? It's a real pain. You have to shift everyone along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So remember, this is a situation we were in last week. Exactly the same situation. Either I use an array sort of list, in which case it's fast to find and hard to insert, or I use a linked list sort of list, in which case it's slow to find but fast to insert. But both of them have this slow component, and if, I've, if the thing's a billion long, that slow is too slow. I don't want to do that. So let's use the solution. Can it, I mean, can't anyone remember? What's this sort of suggesting a linked list? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Didn't you remember we thought of a better solution in the lectures already? <laughs> You're looking behind. That's really well done. Yeah, come on, someone help him out. What should he have said? Not a linked list. A binary tree. Yeah, just you remember that. Yeah. No, no, he's right. He's absolutely right. A binary tree is best because that's fast to find the right spot and fast to insert. So what we're going to do right now to do our link investigating program is we're going to set up a binary tree. Oh, well, actually, how much time have we got? Um, or we could go two ways. How much money have we got? <laughs> How much money have we got? Oh, money. Oh, well done. Look, anyone else that's concerned about their assignment in any way at all, <laughs> just don't forget to write your student number uh, on the note. On the note. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. What do you want to do? We could go two ways. We could write the code to insert it into a tree now, or I could say it's a tutor or lab exercise and leave it for you guys to do, and I could go on talking about something else. Oh, let's, let's have a vote. It's like interactive. Like, here's a worm. Okay? Here's the worm. And this is yes, do it. And this is no, don't do it. And just call out. It's definitely yes. Okay, let's write the code to do it. No. You can't, you can't, you can't call out now. The election's finished. You have to wait four more years. OK. Shh, 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 shh. All right, so let's jump over to my laptop. Da -ding. Let's turn off some lights. Let's tell the uh, laptop. Is it plugged in? Oh, what sort of idiot do you think I am? <coughs> No, it, it, it is plugged in now. <laughs> it wasn't plugged in. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, all right, so here's the code. Now look at this code. Hopefully it looks a bit familiar. This is what we wrote to generate the sequence of random numbers. 
Shh, shh, let's have a look. Uh, we printed out some size stuff. Oh yeah, remember we are fooling around, we are trying to work out how much memory we are going to need to store it. Oh yeah, I was over there saying it was going to take 31 bits to store the numbers. But what, how many bits is it going to take to store these numbers? 64. 64 bits. Yeah, yeah, we are using unsigned long longs. Okay, so that's our code. We square the random number. We strip off the um, uh, right hand bits is the first line. And then we strip off the left hand bits is that last line with the percent. Then we print out the random number and we increase. Okay, so that's our sequence. So what we're going to want to do is insert into the loop here, where are we? Some sort of test that says, have we seen this number before? And if we have, we'll terminate there and then and say, print out the number. You know, print out how, many, how long the loop's been. So it'll print out, a, it's taken me a million steps to get here or three million steps to get here. It'll just print out counter so we know the length of our loop. If we haven't seen it, then we're going to insert it into the tree. Now, the thing with a tree is once you find whether it's in there or not, you're already at the perfect right spot to insert. So although we could write two different functions, one to find the right spot and then one to insert it in there, maybe we should have one function with a side effect that does both things. Maybe in this case, because time's going to be the essence, we're going to have to do this a, million a billion times, possibly. Time will be the essence. Maybe we don't want to waste too much time. So let's write a function called uh, something like mm, num, 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 num. if if, uh, what are we going to call our function to detect if we've seen a loop? If, yeah, if, if, if uh, already seen? If has been, if it's a has been. <laughs> uh, if seen before, and we're going to stick it into our um, structure is going to be uh, what we'll call it our memory. If seen before, in our memory, random number, <laughs> then we'll um, print f loop detected at step uh, percent d backslash n. counter. And I don't want to abort out of the middle of the loop, so what I'm going to set a flag saying uh, loop detected equals true. And this counter here now, I'm actually going to do something radical up here. I'm going to say if not loop detected. And I'm actually not going to even look at the counter at all. And I'll go int loop detected equals false. Now why, why have I, I only want to put one test in my while loop because I know this while loop is potentially, this test is going to be evaluated potentially a billion times. So if I put two things in there, then that's, uh, oh, there's more money on the floor. Good grief. Is that from a student or from me? Oh, this is fantastic. This is, oh, I like being a lecturer. This is good. <laughs> yeah, I might have a hole in my back pocket. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't necessarily want to spend much time. I want to make this part, this loop, which is going to happen a lot, I want to make it as fast as possible. Why didn't I need to terminate on the normal condition here? Why is it sufficient to terminate on the loop? Because that's what I'm interested in, but how do I know this isn't going to give me some sort of infinite behavior? We already know that it, will it will terminate eventually. We know there will be a loop eventually. So if my code's right, yeah. Well, if my code's not right, then, you know, all bets are off. Yep. So while not loop detected, false. So this is just going to go until it finds a loop. Hmm, we might get a long period of silence just sitting there. And if that happens, I'll abort the program and get it to print out a little message every now and then saying, testing 1,000, testing 2,000, testing 3,000, so we can see some sort of progress counter. Or maybe a cute hourglass or, uh, uh, you know, we'll do some sort of progress counter if we need it. But I have a funny feeling we're going to hit loops quite quickly. All right, so we've got loop detected equals true. We've got a hash to find true and false because we haven't done that.
And now I'm going to define my tree. And the tree is going to be, whoa, let's see, type def. Well, you guys tell me, what's a tree got? It's got struct, it's got nodes. It's got nodes. What's that? I think you probably want more ease in your type there. A few more k's. Uh, type def, uh, let's say um, uh, uh, a pointer to a node can be a tree. Let's say that. So, shh. Sh Struct, no, uh, oh, why don't we just say type def, no, oh no, I'll do it this way. So many different ways of doing it. Struct, node, star, tree. How's that look? All right, so that's saying a tree is appointed to a struct node. Uh, can't use capital um, because it's not abstract. In this course, remember, we're only type defing things. The question was, shh, shh, hey, you guys, did you tell me to write the code so you could just have fun? What do you want me to do? Oh, yes, Richard, go over there and write some code. <laughs> we'll just stay here and watch, I promise. Uh, no, so let's go, type def, shh, shh, struct, node, are you all watching? See, I could almost get rid of that struct there, couldn't I? But let's leave it like this for the moment. What's going to be in our struct? What do we need to store? A value? Which is going to be what type? Yes. Uh, unsigned long long value. And then it's going to have a, a tree on the left and a tree on the right. Is everyone happy with that? It could be an avenue, that's right. What's that? Is it called a... Uh, isn't it called a... Memory. Oh yeah, so this is the type, I'm making a type for a tree and then I'm going to create a particular tree that I'm going to call memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see if everyone's happy with that. Everyone being Mr. Compiler, failed star one. Memory undeclared. Oh, that's okay. Yep, I know that's undeclared because I haven't declared it yet. Let's declare it now. So we'll say tree memory um, Oh, it's actually hard having a pointer to the top of the tree, isn't it? I should have... Uh, I need to have a base for the tree, don't I? Uh, so I've got two ways of doing that. Either I could say, uh, I could have something that points to a tree, a struct that points to a tree. But yeah, that's too much work. Why don't I just create... What do you guys think of creating the node at the top of the tree on the stack? Does that sound like a reasonable idea? No, just the first one I see. First one I see, I'll create a node on the stack. What's that? Yeah, yeah, I do know the seat. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I better create, um, if I'm going to do it on the stack, I better say node, the seed node. So I've created a node on the stack now, and remember a node is one of these structs. Yep, so whoop, a node means this. So there's one on the, um, sh sh there's one on the stack, and the tree, my tree is going to, memory is going to point to the seed node, is the address of the seed node. So now I've got my memory pointing to a single node. I've created that single node on the stack. The single node has what in it at the moment? It's just got rubbish in it. We better put something in there. Seed node 
dot, oh, sorry, memory uh, left. What's the left node going to be, tree going to be? Null, because it's empty. What's its right child going to be to start with? Null, it's a completely empty tree. Well, not completely empty, a tree containing exactly one node. So no other nodes needed. And what's the starting value that I'm going to start with? Thank you, the seed. Uh, have I got a variable called seed? Random number. Okay. How's that look? All right, so we, I better put a node in saying what I've done here. Uh, create the top node of the tree. Initially, just store the seed in the tree. That's, uh, yeah, that's a special, uh, special version of initially. Okay, so let's see how we go now. Now we've got to write scene, a function called scene before, and that's going to do all the work, of course. So we better have um, a type def for it, prototype for it. It's going to take in a, what's memory? Shh, 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 shh. Tree. What's random number? Unsigned, long, long. Uh, what does this return? Whether it's seen it before or not, that's going to be a Boolean, which we call int. And see. And let's space that down. How does that look? That looks pretty good. And we'll put a little comment saying here. Returns true if and only if random number is already in tree. <laughs> Otherwise inserts it into the tree. How's that looking? Okay, so we're, shh, shh, we're writing our function, it's got a side effect, it's going to be given a tree, it's going to search through the tree. If the element is already in the tree, that means we've already seen it, so it's going to return true. If it's not in the tree, it's going to return false. And also, if it's not in the tree, it's going to stick it in the tree, so it's there for next time. Does anyone have any question about what, we're, what we want it to do before we write the code to actually do it? Because the code won't make any sense unless... Does everyone... Yes, ask a question. Are we also going to count, count numbers that are in the list? I mean, uh, no, we don't need a counter to count how many numbers are in the list because we're inside a loop already which has a counter variable and every time we pass through the loop we increase the counter. So we have outside of the tree, we're keeping track of how many things we've stuffed in. We could also store it in the tree as well, but then we need a bit more structure in the tree. Okay, so now we've just got to write our one function seen before. Hmm, but it looks ugly, doesn't it? Who thinks that looks pretty ugly? So <laughs> it does, you're right. So concentrate hard on what it, we want it to do. It's, gonna, it's given a tree, we ask it a question, it's like an oracle, is this thing in the tree? And it returns true or false. And if it's not in the tree, it also sticks it in the tree. Woo. We're asking it to do a lot of work. Return already in tree. I like running my return statement first just to make so I don't forget to do it. Int already in tree. What's our default position? Is it already in the tree or not? False. Okay, so it's going to say false and then if we find it in the tree we'd better change that to true before we terminate. Okay, so let's think. Uh, so we've got to find the right spot. Now let's think, let's think, let's think. We're given a, 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 a pointer to a node. What are the things that could happen in this function? We, the function's given a pointer to a node. What are the possible things that could happen? One is, no, we'll never get given a pointer to a null node. So let's assert that, in fact. Assert memory. The way we've written it, we'll never get a null one. Okay. So what could happen? Yes, one. The seed node is the number that you get. Not the seed node, the node we're looking at, the top of the tree, could be the number we're looking for. Okay. Let's go through the cases. So either node at top contains it. If the node at the top contains it, what are we going to do? 
We don't have to add anything and we just return true. true. Or what could happen next? Either that or it is it is smaller <laughs> it is smaller than the node it is smaller than the node um, value if uh, in which case what do we do go left young man we so we what we stick it in the left tree So we're going to stick it. We're going to need to know if it's in the left tree or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or it's larger. We don't have to test for that because that's the way maths works. If it's not smaller and not equal, it's larger. It's a very convenient property that uh, that uh, uh, integers have. They, they're a total order. So um, it is larger. So we stick it, so we investigate the right tree. I shouldn't have just said stick it in, I should say investigate because we're going to stick it in and also test to see if it's there. Okay, so let's do it. So either the node at the top contains it, which means if memory, now I'm dereferencing memory here, what could throw an error? If memory was null, but I've asserted it's not. Whew. Memory could be pointing somewhere rubbishy. Mm, well, uh, hopefully if my tree's well constructed, we'll only ever point. My data structures will always be valid. So if the memory.value equals, right, I won't call it the random number, because seen before doesn't know whether it's random number, and it's just some sort of value. Let's call it the key. I'm searching to see if a key's in there. Is a key in the memory? Change my prototype. No, the prototype doesn't care about the name. I should change it for documentation, but the prototype will happily let you have different variable names. It regards them as comments. Don't have warnings on? No. No, no, it doesn't care. No, it doesn't care. Just the prototype has to be right for types, but not for variable names. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if the memory value is equal to the key, then what do we say? Already. Already. In tree equals true. Ta da! Oop. And we're finished. Else, this is tricky. Uh, let's put our comment up there so we remember what we're doing. All right, so else, if, uh, and actually, I don't like the way I wrote that. Because I would say in English, if the key is equal to the value in the tree, I wouldn't say if the value in the tree is equal to the key. I would actually say it that way around, so let me write it that way around. If, uh, oh, I need the brackets as well. Else if the key is less than the memory value. Oh, let's line them all up so I can even see that I'm doing some sort of... Uh, uh, similar, uh, you know, ex exhaustive set of tests here. So if the key is less than it, then what do I need to do? Well then, already in the tree, already in tree, well now, ah, oh. I've got to check to see if it's null, don't I? Because of this annoying assumption I've got that it's not null. Okay, so we go, if, Richard, uh, tutor exercise will be to write this so it's much neater and simpler. If um, uh, memory dot uh, arrow, what tree? If it's smaller, it goes on the left. Yep. So if the left tree is equal to null, so it should go on the left. I turn to look at the left. There's nothing on the left. It's empty. That tells me that what I'm looking for isn't in the tree because it should be behind this door. What door? There's no door there. So, so if memory left is equal to null, uh, then I, what do I do? I say already in tree equals false. Uh, 
Oh, well, I already know that. That's a default position. So I just need to stick it in the tree. Hmm, how do I stick it in the tree? I'm going to have to do some malloking. So I'm going to go, um, I, I could, but uh, let me just do it in line here because. Uh, Oh, no, I am checking that it's less than. Here we go. Look here. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is all inside this. So I'm in the state now that I've found it's left. I look on the less. I look on the left side where it should be, and I find, oh, there's no tree there at all. It's just completely empty there. So I'd better make a tree and stick it in. And remember, it's not in the tree. So uh, I need to what? I need to say memory.left equals malloc. How much do I need to malloc? Size of, I need to make a new node. So size of, is node just struct node? Did I, where did I call node? Let's have a look. If I've been clever, I'll have actually created node to be a struct node. I have. Woohoo, I can just say node and that actually means struct node, blah, 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 blah. Size of node. So I'm creating a new node. Uh, oh. I probably even could have fitted that on one line, could I? And then now I've created it, what's in there at the moment? What's memory.left contain? Just rubbish. It's a pointer to some, a block of rubbish. So let's stick the values we need in there. Memory left, uh, its value should be what? The key. I'm sticking the key in the tree. And what is it's, this new node I've created, this new part of the tree I've just built, what are its children? They're empty. Yeah, I'm just, it's a whole new node, but it's got nothing under it. It's just one, one new piece of memory. It's not a whole new tree I've made. So memory dot left dot left equals null. Yes, you're right. This really did belong in a function, didn't it? I'm doing everything one step removed. It's, it's a nice shoot exercise to write th what I'm doing here uh, much more neatly. Uh, and that should be... How does that look? That looks good. Okay. So if it was empty, I've stuck it in. We've got to go through our things. So the key was smaller than the top of the tree. So I had to stick it in the left. I went to the left. If it was empty, I've solved that problem. What if the left's not empty? What do I have to do? Go down, go down the left side. And I've already got a function to do that. My friend Recursion will do that for me. He should have done more work for me if I've designed this a bit better. But let's just say here, left, else already in tree equals, what's the name of this function? Seen before uh, the left and the key. Whew. Is that right? Uh, I think it's just, oh, memory, thank you very much. Seen before. I reckon that's looking pretty good. Uh, it's probably going to have a mistake, but who knows? Might not. It's looking that good. It might not. Let's copy it and let's think we need an else. And we'll grab this for our third branch. Not if we want to go down the left, but if we need to go down the right. One annoying thing about trees is just when you think you're finished, you've got to do the other side. But luckily, it's always exactly the same as the first side. So, uh, or Let's just change the comments to be up-to-date comments. Or if it's larger, and it will be, so I don't need to even test for it. Though I could if I was super keen. Um, or I could assert, I guess I want. Uh, if memory dot, what am I going to do now? Right. 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 No, I can't control, replace left with right because which one can't I replace? That one. That one. Oh, yeah, I could have. You're right. Okay, there we go. Oh, uh, there's missing one down here. Whew. Now, what do you think? Does it look like it's going to work? It might be missing a bracket there. Is it missing a bracket here? It looks too messy. Let's compile it and see what it says. Warning implantable blah, 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 of malloc. It's never heard of malloc. Oh, now, now we've got to write our own version of malloc.
Okay, build and go. One, oh look, only one failure. Oh no, two. Assert, it doesn't know about assert. Huh. Oh, it succeeded. Woohoo! All right. Now let's see if it works. There's no free in here because we're going to just build the tree. The tree never gets smaller. We never delete from the tree. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the program terminates and then everything gets freed for us. It is an ugly tree, but there's no need for us to ever free it. The operating system will free it. Uh, it's not an ugly tree, it's just a big tree. All right, let's start off with a test value, a random number. I don't know why it's called random number. It should be called seed, shouldn't it? Did it just run? Can you check the files? Did it just run? Oh, I'm going to call it seed anyway. Oh, no, I'm going to have, oh, I see. Yes, you're right. Random letter. Okay, let's start it off with um, a small number. Oh, L, I need that LL, they weren't ones. Start it off with zero, and we're going to expect to see a termination of the loop straight away, aren't we? Build it and go. And let's, now let's have a look at our output. Run. Console. Loop detected at step zero. Oh, oh, previously it did run, run and look, it found a loop at step 21,000. Ah, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've still got this odd thing here that uh, I've got an enormous amount of white space at the top I can't get rid of. Let's, let's do that again. All right, you guys think of a number that you think might not have a loop. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I hear you cry. Okay, let's try it. Um, uh, run, console. Loop detect, it only lasted 1,200 steps and then it hit a loop. Hopeless, hopeless. Can anyone do better than 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? Oh, that's only going to go for 20,000. Yeah, well done, Richard. Good man, good man. Minus one. Minus one. Oh, yeah, I like the way you think. Someone, now, someone try and get a bigger number than that. Are you working this out on the fly? What about this? What do you think of that? <laughs> Whenever you need a random number, it's always there. Oh, 3,000. It's not very random at all, is it? 42, 42, 42. How many do I need? One, two, three, four, five. Ten long, that's it. Oh, oh it went for a while. Oh, that looked good. Run. Console. 17,000. Oh, it's actually printing them all out at the same time. Have I got a printout statement in there? That'll be slowing it down. Well, actually, it's slow enough that it can even print them out as it goes. That's terrible. It prints them out as it goes, and it's still able to terminate in a split second. If it was going for billions, that printing out should take, you know, a, a week or a year to do. So, yeah, I've printed it out now. See, it just finishes straight away. Okay, so there's a challenge for you. Try and work out, see if you can find, hunting around, see if you can find a decent period on that cycle. You know, if there's any of those numbers go for longer than our very first, our first seed amusingly seemed to have the longest period. All right, now does everyone understand how that worked? I'll post that code up so you can check the tree code because I want you to understand tree code. But the neat thing about that was, shh, 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 was able to look it up lightning fast. Can everyone see that? So it was doing, the time it was 19,000 long, that list, how long should it have taken? 19,000 long. Every one of those numbers, well, on average, 19,000, let's say that's 20,000. Let's look at what happened for the last 10,000 of those 20,000. Each of the last 10,000 of those 20,000 had to search halfway through the list, if it was a list. So each of those last 10,000, if it was a list, would have had to search for 5,000 before they found their right spot. Oh no, they would have had to go to the end. Oh no, it's a sorted list. Okay, so if it was a sorted list, each of them would have had to search halfway through. And there are 10,000 of those. So how much work would those guys have done? 10,000 times 5,000, and you can see that's an exaggeration, an underestimation because, of course, this list gets longer as we insert them. I'm assuming it's staying stuck at 10,000 long. Towards the end, it's 20,000 long. But just in this pessimistic thing here, it's 5,000 times 10,000, that's 50 million. So it had to do 50 million bits of work. And that's an underestimation. Okay, it's probably doing closer to a billion, no, no, 50 million, 100 million. 100 million, probably a couple of hundred million bits of work by the time you get to the end. 
So because we also didn't even include the first 10,000 numbers here. So that's a lot of work it's doing. And even if those 100 million bits of work is just printing out a few lines and doing a few ifs and adding some ones onto some numbers, doing that 100 million times will actually slow the computer down. Now, if the cycle was longer than 10,000, if the cycle was a million long, then the amount of work it's doing, if it was a linear list, would be a million times, well, let's actually work it out. If the list was a million long, to stick the first guy in the list, suppose it has to search to the end of the list, let's just be pessimistic like that, how much work does it have to do? One. How much work does it have to do when it gets to the second guy in the list? Roughly two. How much work does it have to do for the third guy in the list? Three. How much work does it have to do for the fourth guy in the list? Four, five, six. If it was a million long. So the total amount of work is a sum from one to a million. Oh no, you need to do maths to add that up. <laughs> Luckily, you've all been practicing, because remember I told you that's the one bit of maths you need to know in the course. And Gauss knew it when he was in kindergarten. What's the sum from one to a million? n times n plus 1 over 2, or in million speak, a million times a million divided by 2. Okay? What have I done wrong? Why are you laughing? What, what's that? Millions. Oh, man. Yeah, they're looking neatly dressed and they've got high heels on. I reckon they're, yeah, talk of a million can be scary. Okay, so a million times a million is what? It's a long, long number. It's 10 to the 12. What's that? A, a, a t a, it's a trillion, is that right? It's not a billion, it's a trillion. Divided by two is still about a trillion, half a trillion. It's too much time. Your computer, unless it's a teraflop computer, is it a teraflop computer, your computer? Or is it a gigahertz computer, your computer? The Intel didn't release a teraflop chip that they use microprocessors. Okay, so there are, there are teraflop chips out there, but, oh, you can't buy them. but you can't buy them. Yeah, you have to kill someone to get them. <laughs> so basically, on your machine at home, it will take a very long time. As an estimation exercise for you, how long will your machine at home take to do that? You can't do it. But with a tree, oh, I, I should have done. That was a stupid list. With our tree program, what are we going to call our program? Shh, shh, it's a very wonderful program. Let's call it, shh, 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 shh. let's call it the guns program. Using the guns program, because when I think of guns, I think of trees, uh, and attempts to make them smaller, which is sort of our objective here. Uh, the, under the guns program, we have to insert a million things in the tree, and the first time, how much work do we have to do? One. And the second time, how much do we have to do? Oh, sort of uh, uh, log of two, log to the base two of two, which is like one. And the next time we have to do log of uh, three. And the next time we have to do log of four. And the next time we have to do log of five. And the next time we have to do log of six. See, it does look like guns, doesn't it? And if we add up all those logs to log of a million, by the way, what is log to the base two of a million? There's not a lot. What is it? It's 20. All right, we're adding up this long sequence of numbers that's mainly ones, and it's got a few 20s at the end. Even in the worst case, it was 20 throughout, that's 20 million steps. How long does it take your computer to do 20 million things? Done. Okay, so the difference between these two approaches, even for a, a cycle that's only a million long, and remember these cycles could be tens of billions long, or 10 billion long, uh, even for that amount of work, it's a difference between your computer just not working for the rest of the year, and Yes? What happens if the tree just branches out one side. Uh, yeah, if, it's, if a random number generator generated a tree that just branched out on one side, let's think about it. If it's generating a tree that always branches to the right, that tells us that a random number generator is always generating numbers that are increasing. So it's not a very good random number generator. Basically, for it to be a good random number generator, you want each number to be sort of independent of what's just come out already. So 50% chance it's on the left, 50% chance it's on the right. So a random number generator is actually a really nice thing to test a tree on, because if anything's going to give you a balanced tree, hopefully this will. Or a tree's a really good way of testing a random number generator. That's right. That's right. If it's going out on one side, wouldn't it overflow pretty quickly anyway? If it's going out on one side, why would it overflow? Because the numbers would get too big for the Oh, no, not if it started with one. Here's my random number generator. Plus, plus. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not very good. <laughs> 
but it's uniformly distributed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Microsoft random number generator. No, Microsoft random number generator is return. <laughs> Let's have an instant fixed point for every seed. Okay, now that was a lot of talking. Shh, shh. And if you look at all the things I wanted to talk about in today's lecture, that was just some of them. Let's go back and look at the lecture. Okay, our random number generator. I wanted to talk about anagrams, but actually now I think about it, I don't have to. Let me just say this. Last, shh, shh, shh. Last week's lab was to write an anagram tester. And how the anagram tester worked was it went through a dictionary reading in strings one at a time and you had to detect and it sorted them. It sorted, uh, it so do you know what an anagram is? Let me start at the beginning. What's an anagram? Same letter, Santa and Satan. I had never thought of that. That's an excellent one. Well done. What else? Another anagram. Live and evil. You guys have, there's a constant theme going around here. Can we have a non-demonic anagram? Dad and ad. Dad. Dad and dad. Dad and ad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beam and mead. Being and begin. Okay, okay. Shh, 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 shh. Rats and star. Basically, if you get the same letters and you rearrange them and get another valid word, that's called, those, both those words are called anagrams. They're anagrams of each other, in fact. So the exercise was to find all the anagrams in a dictionary. Now the dictionary is reasonably big. Does that ring a bell? It's like we're reasoning with, dealing with a reasonably big amount of data. That tells us if we get it right, it's going to be shoo. If we get it wrong, it's going to be wait all day. So your challenge was to go through the dictionary and find all the anagrams in a dictionary. Now the, the trick that, you know, every, every programmer that's ever dealt with anagrams will tell you this one trick, which is as soon as you get a word, sort the letters of the word into alphabetical order. And then when you get another word, sort those letters into alphabetical order and all anagrams will match. Does that make sense? So instead of every time you get a word having to try every combination of all the letters and try it against every other word, oh, that'll take forever, you sort it, which goes boom, really fast, and then you know exactly what you're looking for. So in your dictionary, as you're building up your anagram dictionary, you keep a track of word, a you have to have a tuple using a struct, I guess, containing the word and what it looks like with the letters all sorted. And then when you stick a new word in, sort its letters and then go through comparing the sorted words, which we'll call the keys. Yeah, yeah, that's, so that's the fast way of testing if it's an anagram. But the slow thing is you've got to go through the whole dictionary. Last week we told you to use a linked list. This week's lab, what are we going to suggest you use? A tree and see if you can get it to go faster. Now, I'm not sure what to do about last week. Last week, everyone was so busy on their assignment, not many people did the lab. So I have two options. One is I just release the lab solutions, and then you can use those solutions to do this week's lab using the tree. Or I say, oh, you can have a week's extension on last week's lab. Yeah, yeah but no, extension should be a word that makes you a bit itchy, because that means you don't get a solution that you can use for this week's lab. And this week's lab will have to drift into next week. And there's stuff that has to be in next week's lab. And then next week's this horrible nightmare of a week. Wouldn't it be better to just say, let's move on. Forget about last week's lab. I'd like to see the solutions. Yeah, yeah? I thought that actually doing it as a tree was easier than doing it as a linked list. Yeah, doing it as a tree will be easier than as a linked list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially now I've given you this code. Uh, so, uh, all right. So is there anyone that really wants an extension on last week's lab? I think the only reason you could want one is you're nervous that you don't have enough lab marks yet and you want a chance to get every lab mark you can. So how about I say in the last week, I'll whack in a couple of extra lab exercises. So in that week, we, hopefully everyone's just bludging around in their last week of term. If you want, you can do a million lab exercises and get a million marks. What do you think of that? Yeah. Yay! Okay. Woo! Woo! Excitement. Okay. Shh, shh. In which case... Shh, 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 shh. I'm, I'm itching to get this lecture finished because the next one's the good one. Um, in which case, I don't have to talk about anagrams at all. I wanted to talk about these two computer chips and comparing them. Let me do that super fast. The current chip, the 98019, all the way around, anagram of that, is, <laughs> you can see why I like anagrams, uh, the, that chip, if you looked, has anyone tried to program using that chip? It's simultaneously fun and annoying. It's fun because you think, oh, I need to do this next. I wish there was an instruction to do that. Oh, there is. Every instruction anyone has ever invented is there. But the problem is, if you want to look something up, you've got to page through 900 pages of instructions to find the one you want to do. And 
You can find one to deal with register one, and register two, but there's no version of that instruction to deal with register three. Or, you know, it's just it's ad hoc and it's a mess and it's complicated, and it's really actually I would say disgusting to program. Plus, it's very annoying because I still only got eight bits of addressable memory, so you can only deal up. With, you've only got 256 memory locations. We've got more instructions really than we've got memory locations. <laughs> so, um, so. We need to improve the chip. Now, basically, we did an exercise two weeks ago where we asked people to suggest how to improve the chip. And some of the chutes were too busy and stressed with the labs to do it, and some of the chutes did it really well. Let me summarize the results of the chutes that did it really well for those whose chutes didn't do it. Essentially, more or less everyone said, this chip is ad hoc and messy and disgusting. Let's even look at it. Where is it? What is it? 8, 8, 9, 0, 1, 7, 9, something. Have I misspelled microprocessor? Ah, oh, here we are. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. here we are. Look at, here's its instruction set. There's a frisbee that you can mount it on. Here's the instruction set. Look. It just goes on and on. 66 of them, and some of them are, oh, there's a four character one there. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of holes in there. Oh, by the way, has everyone worked out why we adopt the numbering scheme we adopt for the... So you put more instructions in? Yeah, sort of. Keep thinking about it. Um, sh 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 no, no, I'll leave that as a puzzle to think about. Um, because I, the main thing I wanted to talk about isn't that. The main thing I wanted to talk about was we needed to simplify this instruction set. I would say this is what we call a complex instruction set. Now, most computer chips, if you know anything about microprocessors, as they evolved... People did it the same way we did. Every time they did a new version, someone said, oh, let's have this instruction. Oh, let's have that instruction. And the chips got bigger and bigger and had this huge, clunky instruction set that if you could start again from scratch, you'd have this really beautiful one. But because everything has to be backwards compatible and things, it just added more and more. And it turned into this ugly, gigantic, enormous, roll, slow, sluggish monster. And that is called a complex instruction set machine, or CISC. And eventually, people thought, oh, what's the matter with that? Oh, that's no good. We should make it simpler. And what did they invent? Reduced Instruction Set Computer, RISC, a RISC machine. Has anyone heard of RISC machines? Yeah, they're really nice. The RISC instruction set is small and tiny, and, and everything works on every register, and everything works on every memory address, and it's just very simple. So I think we need to move away. Would you agree from this? This is what everyone said in their chute, and I was really pleased to see it. We need to move away from this complex beast of a thing and have a very simple chip. Would everyone agree? Yeah. So improvement number one is we're going to convert into a RISC chip. Improvement number two is we need more memory. We're going to extend it. We've got a bit of money in the budget. We're going to make it a 16-bit machine instead of an 8-bit machine. Does that make sense? How much memory does that give us? 64K. What do you think? Is that a lot? No, it sucks. We want a megabyte. What's that? That's enough for everybody. That's enough for everybody. <laughs> 640, I think. So 64K is not enough. So, although, but we don't have enough to make it a 32-bit machine. That's enormous. Going from an 8-bit machine to a 32-bit machine, that would just, you know, everything would multiply enormously. We can't afford to do that. So what I want you guys to do, and this is the instruction set challenge for this week, is I want you to think how the heck can you have it so you can still address a megabyte of memory even though... We've only got 16-bit addresses. And you did, some of you have already done that in your chute, so I want you to propose the instructions we're going to need. You'll propose them for this week. We'll do a last version of the microprocessor over the weekend. And next week, you can program it in your labs, and that'll be the one we take into the exam with us. Okay. So think about it. How can you access a megabyte of memory using only 16-bit instructions? The answer is something to do with segments. Yes? Okay, I'll go and check it out. Have you put microprocessor? Yeah, put it down in category microprocessor. It's got title B16. Yeah, but put category microprocessor on the bottom and I'll find it. And we'll do the revision sometime this week. And you guys talk in your shoot about exactly what instructions you want to see in. All right, so we've done that. Oh, 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 we're racing through everything. That's really cool. All we've got to do now is... Oh, that's it. No, that's the right spot. Oh. Forward. Hamming. I didn't tell you hamming. And I didn't tell you the bicycle wheel puzzle. Uh, we'll do hamming next week. 
We'll do that in the Monday lecture. And the bicycle wheel puzzle goes like this. It was in beta a couple of weeks ago. I've got a bicycle wheel of radius one and one kilometer. This is an Edgar Allan Poe story. Does everyone know the Edgar Allan Poe story about the person that's trapped inside an enormous circular jail made of rock? And every day they have to reach through the wall and pull on a chain and the rock slowly rotates under a mountain and you go through the whole wheel and eventually you pop out the other side. There's only one entrance and exit. It's just one hole in the mountain and you have to grind the whole wheel all the way around to get back out. And every day every prisoner pulls on the chain and the wheel slowly rotates by one every day. And it's like got a thousand cells in it, so you're in jail for a thousand days or something. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Well, that's happening to us, sadly. We're stuck inside the big wheel, but it's escaped from the hill. And this is us. We're just standing on the edge of the big wheel. And the wheel rolls. Boom. And your path goes something like, I don't know, what is it? Is that right? I got that right? Uh, it's a cycloid or something. Okay, yep. Does, everyone, does that make sense to everyone? So the wheel's rolling forward at the same time as it's rotating. You're stuck on this part of the wheel. And you, 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 through space, if you're holding a sparkler, this is the line you would make in the night. Um, now, the question in beta was, how long is this line? And I, I looked at that puzzle. I was standing there with one of the tutors, Alex, and I said, oh, I know the answer straight away. And I said the wrong answer. And Alex laughed and laughed and laughed and was very pleased. Uh, and he went away and he's worked out the right answer. I went, but he used MATLAB to work it out. I used Python to work it you out. You used Python to work it out. I want you guys to use pencil and paper. Pencil and paper. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to use C to work it out. Now, how could you work this out using C? You could use Google, OK? That'll just tell you the answer straight away. Don't do that. I want you to write a program that calculates the length of this arc. But let's suppose you've forgotten all your maths after year nine, you hate maths, and you're really lazy and you only want to write a really short program and you've got like 10 minutes to work out the answer and you don't have time to do any form of calculus or whatever. How are you going to solve this problem? Abstraction. Abstraction? Oh, you're even too lazy to do abstraction. Yeah, just get the computer to do it. Get the computer to solve it for you. How can the computer solve it? Well, you don't have to use math dot anything or anything fancy. All I want you to do is I want you to do what we call a simulation, which is I want you to think that this wheel has to roll from there to there. How far is that distance? Uh, oh, what's the circumference of a circle? 2 pi r. So if that's 1 kilometers, that must be 2 pi kilometers from there to there. All right, I want you to divide that into 1,000, a million, a billion, some number, n intervals, each being exactly that big. And I want to know, after that amount of time, where the person is on this path. I want you to plot their position on this path over time. And I want you to calculate this. I don't care how many times you do it. Let's suppose you do it a thousand times. And then what am I going to get you to do? I'm going to get you to just draw little straight lines here. Oh, you need to use math.h to get sine and cosine. All right, use math.h to get sine and cosine then. Or write your own. <laughs> no, no, you're right. You don't. So sine and cosine will tell you the position around the wheel at any given instant, but also the wheel's moving forward at a constant rate. So your sine and cosine will give you the right height. Yeah, if you just work out the, how it moves around the circle, the height that you get is if the circle was standing still will be correct. But the distance this way will not be correct. It'll be the distance you've moved around the circle in the x-coordinate plus the distance you've moved forward. Does that make sense? So you'll need to add those two numbers together. So you'll calculate these points. It's just like one line of maths to calculate each of these points. And what will you do to work out the length of the segment between these points? You use Pythagoras' theorem. So basically, you're just going to work out the x displacement and the y displacement at every tick of time. Use Pythagoras' theorem, and that'll tell you the length of the line between them. Sum that over the whole thing. You write a while loop and a plus equals to add on this. Yeah, does that all make sense? It's like two or three lines of programming. You should try and do it. And to make it more accurate, make n bigger and bigger and bigger. And watch how the answer changes as n changes. And you'll soon find there's a sweet point where changing the value of n doesn't actually give you any increase in accuracy in your answer in the decimal, number of decimal places you're looking at. And that's a nice value to use for n. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, so give a whack at that. And then you've used computers to solve a problem using simulation rather than using um, fancy maths. And that's a nice thing to do. Whew, and that's all I wanted to say in the lecture. 
So let's take a break and then we'll return and do the interesting lecture. So break for um, not too long, five minutes maybe. <laughs>